Well, good evening and welcome to AAAP meeting tonight. We all expected to be on campus, but uh, their nature got in the way. I think that uh, in the good old days, maybe we'd have believed that they would have cleared the snow in time, but um, didn't happen. And Princeton sent us the word that they're shutting down the campus, at least for the purposes of extracurricular activities. So here we are meeting by Zoom once again. So I'm glad to see you all tonight. We actually have a fantastic uh, presentation set up and there was going to be a book signing. Um, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, maybe we can talk about how, how some way that can be engineered, but uh, we'll get into that in a moment. I have a, a couple of announcements and things to try to get us in the mood. So the way it's going to run tonight as we generally run uh, after a few uh, things to get us uh, into the astro mood, we'll go right into our main presentation. I'll turn it over to Victor, who will introduce our guest speaker, and we'll go as long as that uh, needs to go and take a brief intermission, then come back and talk about astronomy activities going on around the club. And I do have another observer's challenge for you, so you want to stick around for that. But the big announcement is that, that there are some effects of the solar eclipse that even though it hasn't happened yet, uh, we've gotten our heads together and realized that on April 8th, uh, which is the day before the total eclipse of the sun, uh, AAAP, um, sorry, April 8th, the day of the eclipse, AAAP will not hold any live eclipse events for the main reason that most of our core members are going to be traveling to get to the line of totality. And I'm sure most of you on this meeting tonight have thought this through and figured out where you're gonna be. And what that really means is there won't be any, enough experienced observers hanging around the Princeton area to man our observatory. And we're mentioning this because the last time we had even a partial eclipse here in Princeton, we had hundreds of, of uh, public interested in observing and we set up a big day out at Washington Crossing observing so observatory. So that's not going to happen. Uh, we did um, recognize also that our April 9th meeting is not going to be able to happen either. So the monthly meeting regularly scheduled for April 9 will not happen again because so many of us will be traveling for the eclipse. We have placed a really interesting NASA live eclipse broadcast link onto the AAAP website and we would guide you to check that out. Uh, many of you may have found other websites of interest and we can talk about those but at least we have one we think will be very worthwhile. So check out the AAAP website for that NASA live broadcast link when April 8th comes around. And so uh, looking more carefully into the eclipse situation I found an amazing map which you can get off the NASA website. Anyway, I urge you to check out the solar eclipse through the eyes of NASA on their website. You can see it at the top there, but you can find this with an easy uh, Google search. It's an amazing amount of research that has gone into this. And, you know, we should talk about where is everybody planning to go? Um, I, for instance, am actually going to be back in Indiana where I have relatives and where we have some uh, reason to be. And it turns out of all places, <laughs> central Indiana is on the path of totality. And one thing I hadn't recognized until I pulled up this NASA map is actually the change in time when totality is occurring. Of course, it's a shadow that moves across the country. So make sure you're aware of the timing. I had uh, somehow blithely thought that it was happening at 155 everywhere, but obviously it is not. And these are the times where the oval of the umbra of the moon's shadow is crossing into the area shown on the map. So it's a really, really great map. You can see I've tried to highlight with yellow highlight lines the areas of partial eclipse. Uh, the first yellow line at the top that goes through central New Jersey is 90% and the next one is 85. So we in the Princeton area are somewhere between 85 to 90% totality. And I think that's going to actually look kind of like an annular eclipse if I looked at the diagrams online. Right. It will be pretty spectacular, but nothing like the totality. So we could talk about this uh, after the break, maybe figure out where everybody's going and just jazz it up a little bit, talk about the future.
want to get us a little bit more into the mood of thinking like astronomers and just remind us all of what's up in the sky now as we are getting rather late in winter and the wonderful patch of nebula uh, emissions uh, that we talked about last month moving now to the west as is Jupiter moving to the west and and becoming more difficult to observe, while in the east we see rising at dark fall a whole host of galaxies. And that's why we always talk about spring as galaxy season, the dense clusters of galaxies in the constellation Leo and in Ursa Major, and eventually Virgo will be coming into great position for viewing. And last week, it was the new moon, and now that we're heading into a crescent moon tonight, a thin crescent visible, but last week was superb time for imaging, and a number of you on this meeting tonight are astro imagers, and you probably had your scope out because we actually had a few clear nights in the middle of last week as the new moon was coming on. So I had my rig up and running and was able to look at the objects. I show you an example up in the northern sky in Ursa Major, the onset of the galaxies, as well as down in Leo, and then in the constellation Auriga, some of the last of the emission nebula that were still in good position last week. Here, the giant spiral structure of Messier Eddy 1 up in Ursa Major came through despite the light pollution here in central New Jersey. I was able to get this image. And I'm showing you a couple of images not to suggest that they're particularly good, but rather to suggest that these are the kinds of things that you can do. If you are into astro imaging with your own equipment, you already realize this with the with the amazing mm -hmm. camera equipment, especially that has evolved and with the mount sophistication available to us, these are now within grasp of observers, even here in central New Jersey, something that I couldn't have said perhaps 10 years ago. Uh, another example out in the Mission Nebula area in the constellation Auriga, one of the most beautiful features of this is the region of new star formation and all that the star cluster in the middle. Of course, difficult to discern stars in the actual formation region from background stars in our own galaxy, but many of those in the center of this red emission nebula are stars that have formed in the gas clouds as starburst formation occurs, the tadpole nebula. I know I kind of hate these names, they call it the Tadpoles Nebula. And one last image to share with you as Leo the lion comes into good viewing position. And these are galaxies many have seen. And I'm happy to show this because the first time ever I have a rig that has a wide enough field of view that I can get all three of these imaged into one shot. And there you see Messier 65 and 66 and off, off to the left. Yeah. Didn't quite cut it as a Messier object, yeah. but a GC object. And this trio in Leo is something that uh, everybody loves to try to get. And so I want to show you some more things having to do with Jupiter, but I'm going to leave that, that until after the main event. Uh, but I will remind you that if you're interested in astro imaging and do not yet uh, have not yet gotten involved with the AAAP's subgroup, we have a very active uh, interest group, the IIIP Astro Imagers, and here's some contact information of how you can become a member of this uh, IIIP only group. And we share images and how to knowledge on a monthly basis, uh, the fourth Tuesday of each month. So uh, get involved with your own equipment. Here's a chance to do so. Okay, so we'll come back to some of this after the break, but I want to get uh, our main speaker going tonight. So, Victor, I am going to turn my screen over to you. I'll stop sharing now, and you have the floor. Victor Davis, our program chair. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Professor Helfand for Zooming with us. It was not his first choice by any means, but the weather has thrown us a curve. Um, but he was going to be speaking tonight, um, sort of summarizing his book, The Universal Timekeepers, Reconstructing History Atom by Atom. 
um, by utilizing the basic building blocks of matter as imperturbable little clocks, we are now able to reconstruct in quantitative detail a remarkable range of human and natural events, from detecting art forgeries to dating archaeological sites, and from laying out a detailed history of human diet and the Earth's climate to revealing the events surrounding the origin of life of the solar system and of the universe itself. Atoms provide us with a precise chronology from the beginning of time to the moment humans emerge to contemplate such questions. So here's a little bit about our guest speaker tonight. Uh, Professor David John Helfand has been on Columbia's faculty for about 46 years, nearly half that time as chair of the Department of Astronomy. He's authored more than 200 scientific publications and mentored 22 PhD students, mostly in high energy astrophysics. Yet most of his pedagogical efforts have been aimed at teaching science to non-science majors. Um, after a very lengthy effort, he was able to add to Columbia's famous core curriculum, um, a science course called Frontiers of Science. Um, it's sort of a way of inculcating into students what he calls scientific habits of mind. Uh, Professor Helfand uh, received Columbia's 2001 Presidential Teaching Award and the 2002 Great Teacher Award from the Society of Columbia Graduates. In 2005, he became involved in the effort to create Canada's first independent nonprofit secular university, Quest University Canada, first as a visiting tutor, then as president and vice chancellor. For six years in a row, Quest was ranked number one in North America in the National Survey of Student Engagement. Professor Helfen served as president of the American Astronomical Society and was named as a Society Legacy Fellow in 2020. He's currently chair of the boards of the American Institute of Physics and of AIP Publishing. He's a member of the executive committee of the Board of Science Counts, an organization formed to communicate with the public about the importance and impact of publicly funded fundamental research. And I understand act just from reading his earlier book that he was involved in making the Hayden Planetarium into what, what it is today, which is a, uh, an effort we all need to thank him for. Anyway, thank you very much, Professor Helpin. It's good to have you here. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. I would have even greater pleasure if I were with you all, uh, but we'll have to make do with what we've got. So if I take this piece of paper and I tear it in half, then I have two pieces of paper. If I take one of those and I tear it in half, I still have two, albeit smaller, pieces of paper. And if I continue this process for long enough, it's not hard to believe that I could get to the point where I'd have the smallest possible unit of matter that had all the properties, the color, the texture, the density of the substance we call paper. This idea that there's the smallest unit of matter was first posited, as far as written down anyway, by the Hindu philosopher Kanada, and he called the smallest unit of matter the Anu. This idea propagated from the Indian subcontinent to ancient Greece in the 5th century BC, where it was picked up, admittedly as a minority point of view, by the philosopher Leucippus and his very energetic and long-lived student Democritus. They called this smallest unit of atom of matter the atomos, which from which we derive the word atom today. Now, atomos in Greek means uncuttable. And despite the fact that we now know that atoms have an elaborate internal structure and are not by any means uncuttable, they can be dis disconnected from each other, disconnected uh, from their pieces. But, and furthermore, that the smallest unit of matter that retains all of the characteristics of the macroscopic piece of matter is not an atom, but a collection of atoms in a certain specific ratio and a certain three-dimensional configuration called a molecule. We still use atoms as our basic unit of matter 
And as I'll try to convince you of in the next hour, we can use these atoms as microscopic historians that allow to re reconstruct an amazing array of things about human culture, about prehistory, and about the origin all the way back to the beginning of space and time itself. Now, atoms are tiny, which is why the Greeks and the Hindus couldn't specify how many times you'd have to cut the paper in half. And I don't know if you can see that poppy seed. Can you see that poppy seed on my finger? Yes, I think you can. Yes. That poppy seed contains 15 million trillion atoms, which is a very big number. If, for example, that poppy seed were made of atoms the size of little glass marbles, then the poppy seed would be the poppy seed that ate Manhattan. It would be about 23 miles across and 23 miles high, or 110 times the height of the Empire State Building. Now, obviously, we don't interact with atoms on their scale. That's so enormously small compared to our world, and their world behaves very differently, as we'll see. But we interact with matter in this simpler way of calling things solids, liquids, and gases. And the distinction between solids and liquids and gases has nothing to do with what they're made of, what the substances that comprise them are, but in fact, it just has to do with how the fundamental particles interact with each other. So in a solid, the particles here are locked in place. They're touching each other, and all they can do is jiggle back and forth. And the warmer you make them, the more that rapidly they jiggle, but they're touching each other and they can't go anywhere. Whereas in a liquid, while they're still touching each other, you can't compress your cup of coffee, don't try it, you'll get third degree burns, but they are slightly less locked and so they're free to slide around over the top of each other, which is why a liquid can take the shape of the container into which you pour it because the atoms are free to move however they need to as long as they're still touching. In a gas, in the air in this room, for example, the atoms are about I can't quite do it here, this far apart, about 10 times their diameters apart, and they interact like billiard balls. They just bounce off each other, bounce off the screen, and interact like that. So the only difference is the way the basic particles of matter are with respect to each other, how close together they are, and how they interact. Now, in fact, there are four kinds of matter, and most of the universe is in the fourth kind, which we call a plasma, in which case the atoms themselves or the, the particles themselves are completely deconstructed. Their constituents are thrown apart and they run around at very high speeds interacting with each other like boomerangs. <clears throat> but since we don't have that on Earth, we won't worry about that today. Now, as I said, the basic unit of any kind of matter that retains the properties of that kind of matter are called molecules. And there are millions of kinds of molecules that occur in nature and millions more that we've synthesized in the lab. The simplest, one of the simplest ones is this shown here, made of two kinds of building blocks, the H kind of building block and the O kind of building block. Two H's and an O in that configuration gives you H2O or a water molecule. These basic building blocks are what we call atoms. And there are only 118 kinds of atoms. Atoms, however, as unlike the Greek uncuttable concept, have an internal structure that's rather elaborate they have a positively charged nucleus and negatively charged particles called electrons orbiting around outside. If we, we zoom in further, we see that that nucleus, which is positively charged and tiny on the atomic scale, as we'll see in a minute, is actually composed of two different kinds of particles itself, the protons, which contain the positive charges, and the neutrons, which act sort of as padding to keep the protons with their positive charges want to fly apart to keep them stuck together. And if we zoom in further on the protons and neutrons, we see they are not fundamental, but in fact, they're made of even more fundamental particles called quarks, and they make up, uh, they're made up of triplets of these quarks. It's a little embarrassing that the number of fundamental particles we end up in in this picture numbers 31, which doesn't make them sound very fundamental. And it could well be that there's a layer below this that we haven't gotten to yet, but since the 1960s, this has been the level we've been stuck at, and this is our hierarchy of matter. But for today's purposes, we don't need to worry about the quarks and the, and the uh, neutrinos. We just need to worry about the atoms and their nuclei, because they will be our witnesses to history. Now, just so we have the nomenclature right so we can go on, you've all seen this kind of model for an atom. This is the model of a carbon atom. 
It's got six protons in red, six neutrons in yellow, and six electrons in blue. Each atom, each of the 118, has a one or two letter atomic abbreviation. In the case of carbon, it's just C. And it has an atomic number, which is shown down here as a subscript to the left of the symbol. And it's six. Now, these two terms are completely redundant with each other, because if it has six protons, it's got to be carbon. And if it's carbon, it's got to have six protons. So we often don't put this little six here, although it's helpful to remember where it is in the periodic table. This number, however, is going to be crucially important in our discussion. That's the atomic mass. And it's not really a mass in kilograms. It's a mass that just counts the number of neutrons plus the number of protons. So in the case of this model atom here, six protons, six neutrons, it means this is carbon-12. And I'll talk about it that way, carbon with this number following it, carbon-12. Now, this picture is nice. It's a mnemonic, but it's grossly inaccurate. And most textbooks don't point this out. To start with, the electrons are more than 10,000 times smaller than the protons and the neutrons, whereas they're drawn the same size in this picture. But even more egregious is the relative locations of the electrons and the nuclei. If I use one of these tennis balls and put it outside my office on 120th and Broadway and said that represented the nucleus, then the electrons would be orbiting through the South Bronx and New Jersey. That is the first, the closest in electrons. The atom is 99.9999999999% empty space. And these electrons are so infinitesimally small, we haven't even been able to measure their size. So this picture of the atom is really an exaggeration in the extreme. And we have to remember that when we're talking about real atoms that look in a model more like this. Okay. Now, the thing about those electrons is that they're not just orbiting anywhere through the South Bronx in New Jersey. There is exactly specific distances from the nucleus that they can reside. And they cannot exist. They can't just not be there. They can't exist unless they're in one of those locations. And there's a whole hierarchy of those locations moving away from the nucleus. This is because of the particle quantum particle wave duality uh, that quantum mechanics tells us about. We don't need to worry about that stuff today. But it's important because it means that there are specific energy states the electron can occupy close to the nucleus, farther out here, farther out here, but not anywhere in between. And the jumps in energy between those discontinuously means that they can eat and emit particles of light, we call photons, at only very specific energies and therefore very specific wavelengths or very specific colors, which allows us to identify them across 10 or 12 billion light years of space not only to say, oh yes, there are carbons out there too, carbon atoms out there too, but that that carbon atom is identical to eight decimal places to the carbon atoms that make up our fingernails. We can see this because each atom has a unique set of these energy levels and therefore an unambiguous fingerprint or barcode, if you will. So if we have something like a star and this light is coming to us, most of the light passes right by these atoms, but at very specific wavelengths, they'll get absorbed and redirected in some other direction. And so it'll produce a black line on the spectrum. Could be a faint black line, could be a bright black line. And that tells us how much of the substance is there. So here's the actual spectrum of the sun. And you see there are literally thousands of these lines because each of the 100 and, or each of the 94 kinds of naturally occurring atoms come in, have a whole ladder of energy levels and represent a unique fingerprint for that atom. So some of these are very, very dark, meaning there's lots of a hydrogen line. Some of them are very faint. That's something like titanium or something that's very rare. And so here's our arrangement, and I'm not gonna go into this. The book goes into it in some detail as to why it looks like this. Most people who take high school chemistry can never figure out why they built the periodic table to look like this. But it's got everyone there from number one hydrogen to number two helium, number three lithium, number four beryllium, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, we get to neon, then we go back over here to 11, 12, et cetera. One through 118 are all there. Now we say there are 94 naturally occurring elements because the first 94 are all found in the environment. But that doesn't mean those other heavier elements, which so far on earth have been synthesized in the lab, don't exist in nature. They're almost certainly produced in nature and they're probably ones beyond 118 produced in nature. But those atoms, those nuclei, 
have so many positive particles packed into such a small space, they have such a repulsive energy that none of them are stable. They all fall apart. And so they don't live very long and therefore we don't see them in the crust of the earth. Now that's the 118 kinds of atoms with 118 protons from one to 118. But the key part of using these nuclei to reconstruct history is isotopes. Iso means equal, topos means place. So isotopes means they're atoms of a given element and therefore in a given atomic number and therefore a given unwavering place in the periodic table, that's the number of protons but they have different atomic masses, which means they must have different numbers of neutrons. And indeed, that's exactly what's going on. So in hydrogen, for example, hydrogen always has one proton. So it's always in the upper left-hand corner of the periodic table. But it can have one proton and no neutrons, which is the typical kind of hydrogen, one proton and one neutron, and one proton and two neutrons, which are called deuterium and tritium, respectively. Now, what is this change about the way the atom interacts? Nothing, because the electron is still where it was. It's attracted to this proton. It's at a certain energy, the energy. distance from the proton. And as a consequence, the electron behaves, the atom behaves the way it would, because this electron's over in New Jersey or over in the South Bronx somewhere, doesn't care about the nucleus of the atom. Here we have carbon. Carbon also comes in three varieties. There's carbon 12 with six protons and six neutrons, carbon-13 with six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon-14 with six protons and eight neutrons. And the only difference between these different atoms or isotopes of the same kind of element is the mass. And so carbon-12 with six protons and six neutrons, let's say that's one. Carbon-13 is 8% heavier. Carbon-14 is 17% heavier. Now, the isotopes aren't randomly distributed. They're isotopes that make up most of the element that we find on Earth, say 100 atoms of carbon-12, there'll be only one or one and a half, one and a 1 1.1 atoms of carbon-13, and only one in a trillion atoms are carbon-14. Now you might think, well, one in a trillion, who cares why you even worry about it? In your thumbnail, there are 5 billion carbon-14 atoms. And so again, the, the message is atoms are really, really small. So the carbon-14 is important and it's a critical part of our story. And it's a critical part of the story because it provides, as Victor said, the imperturbable clock. Carbon-14 is what we say is radioactive and it undergoes decay. Now there's nothing slimy or decayed about the product that it produces, which just the historical transformation is called a decay. Carbon-14 is unstable because it doesn't have a good number ratio of protons to neutrons. It's got six protons and eight neutrons. The light atoms down here at the top of the periodic table like to have equal numbers of protons and neutrons. So what this atom will do, what this nucleus will do, is spontaneously transform itself into nitrogen-14, which is seven protons and seven neutrons. <coughs> Excuse me. And it will do so by spitting out an electron. You might say, well, where did that come from? There's no electrons in the nucleus. They were out in New Jersey somewhere. But in fact, there's energy in the nucleus and energy can use, be used to create particles. So six positive particles here, seven positive particles here, minus one is six, so the equation balances. And then for other reasons, which we won't worry about tonight, it spits out an antineutrino to cancel out this lepton that it produced here. But the important thing about this is the limited range of stability for different isotopes. So here's a line, number of protons on the x-axis, number of neutrons on the y-axis, and this is the line P equals N. And you can see down here for the first 10 or 15 elements, the darks, darkest ones are the stable isotopes. The dark ones have equal numbers of protons and neutrons. But as we get up and pack more and more protons into this tiny little space, and their mutual like charge repulsion tries to blow the nucleus up, we have to add more and more neutrons in as padding and as extra glue to keep the nucleus together. And so the stable isotopes wander away from this N equals P line until you end up with things that have, say, 92 protons and 146 neutrons. The th reason this is so important is because it provides a truly imperturbable clock. If I have a carbon-14 nucleus, I can dump acid on it. I can hit it with a sledgehammer. 
I can cool it to minus 440 degrees Fahrenheit. I can heat it to 5 billion degrees. I will not affect one iota the probability of it transforming itself into a nitrogen-14 nucleus. And it does so in this interesting probabilistic way, a manner which Einstein never accepted in his entire life, but which over the 100 years since it's been, this 125 years now since it's been discovered, has been verified over and over again. And that is, I can characterize each nucleus, each different nucleus, each isotope of each element, with something called a half-life, which is the time over which a nucleus has a 50% chance of decaying. Or, uh, equally, if I have a 1,000 nuclei, the time over which I'll end up with only 500 nuclei left. That's called the half-life. Now, you might think, well, if you have a 1,000 nuclei and 500 of them decay in one half-life, then the other 500 will decay in the next half-life. But that is not true. And it's not true because this is a fundamentally probabilistic process, which means this nucleus doesn't have a memory. It doesn't know when you started looking at it. All it knows is that it has a 50% chance of falling apart in one half-life. So if it gets to here, it still has a 50% chance of falling apart in the next half-life. So it goes from a half to a quarter of the sample. I'd have 250 left. And these guys here, they don't remember what was going on. So they have a 50% chance of decaying in the next half-life, three half-lives, down to one-eighth, down to one-sixteenth, down to one-thirty-second. We keep going down and down and down, such that the number remaining at any given time is given the number by the number you started with times one half raised to the power t over t one half. And for carbon 14, for example, the half life is an interesting number for charting the history of civilization. It's 5,730 years. So if I start with a carbon 14 nucleus today, it has a 50% chance of decaying in the next 5,730 years. It has a 75% chance of decaying in the next 11,460 years, et cetera, et cetera, down this curve. How do we use this to reconstruct history? Let's start with the Shroud of Turin. So the Shroud of Turin first makes its appearance on the historical scene in the middle of the 14th century in France, in a certain collegiate church where the cleric, decides to make a lot of money by displaying what he claims is the burial shroud of Christ. You see this faint, faint image impressed on this large piece of linen. It's got blood at the hands where the nails went into the cross and the feet, and it looks like a serene figure impressioned on this piece of linen cloth. In the Middle Ages, of course, pilgrims would flock to such relics of the church and this guy made a fortune of displaying this cloth, this cloth. How can we judge whether this is genuine or not? Well, there are a number of ways to do it, but for decades, the Catholic Church refused the definitive way to do it, which is to measure its carbon-14 age. What is a carbon-14 age? Linen comes from flax. Flax is a plant, grows in the field. All plants, all plants on earth, from phytoplankton in the ocean to sequoias in California, operate by sucking carbon dioxide out of the air, using solar energy to break the bond between the carbon and the O2, carbon dioxide, breathing O2 back into the air, which is nice for us because that's what we breathe for our energy, and taking the carbon and linking it in chains to make cellulose and lignin and fructose and glucose and all the other plant molecules that plants make. When the flax is alive in the field, it's sucking in carbon 12O2, carbon 13O2, and carbon 14O2. But as soon as you cut it, it stops doing that. It's dead, right? And so the carbon 12 is still there. The carbon 13 is still there. The carbon 14 is decaying. And so the longer you wait, the less carbon 14 to carbon 12 ratio there is. So judging from my equations here, the number at time t is the number at time t equals zero times one half to the time t here over the half-life. So if this cloth were actually woven in 1350, which is when it first appeared, then we'd expect this ratio here, if I started with 1,000 carbon-14 atoms, I'd have 922 left. Whereas if it were actually woven in 30 AD, 30 in the Common Era, then I'd only have 786 left. So it would look like this. If it were 1350, I'd be at 92.2. And if it were 30, I'd be at 78.6. Now you might think, well, see, those aren't very different from each other. 
we can measure these to four decimal places. These are radically different from each other. It's unambiguous. And in ninth, now, in this case, we didn't actually have to do this experiment because there was a perfectly good documented case about where this cloth came from. It came in a letter from one of the bishops in France to the Avignon Pope in 1358, where he said, the case, Holy Father, stands thus. Sometime since the dean of a certain collegiate church, to wit that of Leary, falsely and deceitfully being consumed with the passion of avarice and not from any motive of devotion, but only of gain, procured for his church a certain cloth, cunningly painted, the truth being attested by the artist who had painted it, to wit that it was a work of human skill and not miraculously wrought. So that letter is dated 1358. Finally, in 1988, the church relented. Two little, three little pieces about the size of my thumbnail were snipped off the corner and sent to three independent carbon dating labs around the world. And the answer came back. The flax was cut down in 1325, plus or minus 65 years, wholly consistent with this letter. Well, that's fine for cases where the provenance is attested to in writing. But what about other kinds of forgeries? In 1930, the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York was offered this painting, the betrothal of Saint Ursula, which had been attributed to Jorge Inglés, who was an artist from Spain in the middle of the 15th century. It was attested to as being genuine by Sir Lionel Cust, who was the chairman of the British Portrait Museum, and that's a pretty good recommendation. But the cost was going to be, in 1930, the first year of the Great Depression, $2.4 million. And I guess the people at the museum were a little nervous about spending that much money on this medieval painting, and so they asked for a second opinion. And the person they asked was this fascinating character who I talk a little bit about in the book, named Belle de Costa Green, who was J.P. Morgan's librarian at the Morgan Library, two and a half, block, two and a half miles downtown. And she declared it was a forgery. And because it had been attributed originally to a Spaniard, she called it the Spanish forger. Now, she did this just on the basis of her historical arguments, having herself acquired for the Morgan Library 20 years earlier several illustrated manuscripts that looked very like this, which she had come to believe, in fact, were forged. And here's one of them here. In fact, the so-called Spanish forger probably worked in Paris around 1900, and there were more than 350 of these forgeries around the world. So many, in fact, there are shows. The Morgan Libraries had a show collecting all the forgeries to show them all together. Now, if you use the carbon-14 trick we just used on the Shroud of Turin, you'd conclude, indeed, this was 1450, because this wood, and in this case, the vellum on which this book was printed, uh, were from, for, from, from the 1400s. So the carbon-14 dating testifies the works are original. Now, suppose they are original. You don't want to go in there and scrape off a bunch of pigment and take it to your chemistry lab to analyze it. So you give it to physicists instead. You might want to compare, for example, the green leaves that go around the edge here with the green trees in here. The colors are essentially identical. Were they painted with the same pigment at the same time? And to find that out, we use a technique called autoradiography. So what we do is we take the painting, in this case, out to the Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, and we irradiate it with neutrons. Now, neutrons are great because neutrons have no charge, so they don't interact with electrons, they don't interact with protons, they just go right through that big atom that's got the electron in New Jersey and the South Bronx. But very rarely, even though we're illuminating it with a billion neutrons per square centimeter per second, and we illuminate it for 90 minutes, very rarely one of the neutrons will hit smack on to the nucleus and embed itself in the nucleus, and therefore transform the nucleus from one isotope to another. So it works something like this. Say you have a thorium nucleus in a pigment in the painting. You fire a neutron and it sticks. So thorium-234 here then is unstable because it's got the bad ratio of protons to neutrons. And so it spits out an electron and decays to protactinium-234. Still got the same number of positive particles and the same number of neutrons but it's got one more positive particle and one fewer neutrons. That decay excites the nucleus. It's all discombobulated now. It's like pulling marbles out from the bottom of a jar of marbles. And they clinkle back down again, and they give off energy in the form of a photon, but a photon of a very specific energy corresponding to one of the energy levels in the nucleus of this atom. 
and then it becomes a relaxed protactinium nucleus. So the process is as follows. We fire trillions and trillions of neutrons at this painting. We then take a piece of film and put it on the front of the painting. I see some of this group at least are old enough to remember what film is. My students have no clue what film is, but anyway. So you put the film there and the electrons come flying off the paintings when the radioactive nuclei decay and they pinpoint exactly where the pigment is coming from. And then you take away the film and you put it back and take it away and put it back, exposing it at different time periods. And then you put the detector to record the X-rays and the gamma rays that are coming off, which gives you a unique signature for each nucleus so you know which element is producing these electrons. And so, for example, when we compared the green leaves here, which look indistinguishable from the green trees here, we find that after 25 days, after the exposure of this painting to neutrons, the trees are completely inactive, nothing's happening, no radioactive decay. While the leaves remain bright, they're still decaying dramatically. And that's because the painting in here is by the master forger, and he used the pigment that's called Paris Green that contains arsenic, which has a half-life of 26 hours. So after 25 days, there's less than a millionth of the radioactive nuclei still left to decay. And the same pigment was used in this painting here, copper arsenate. What you do is you excite this, you add a neutron to this arsenic, it makes it a radioactive isotope of arsenic, it decays, and the Paris green, which was first made in 1814, is shown to be a forgery. Now here's another painting that actually does hang today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art by Anthony Van Dyke. And there's no question that this is not a forgery. St. Rosalie interceding for the plague stricken of Palermo. And it's a huge painting. It's a really big painting. You've probably seen it. And, but it contains a secret, which we wouldn't know about otherwise. They might say, well, David, you didn't scrape any paint off, but you irradiated this with lots of neutrons and you changed some of the nuclei. Some of the nuclei in the painting are not the same. Yes, we changed about five nuclei out of every trillion nuclei. And if we want to picture what that's like, we'd have a warehouse from a New York City block, from an avenue to avenue, and one block north and south. And that warehouse would be 20 stories tall, and it would be full of glass marbles this big, okay? And in that warehouse, there'd be a trillion blue glass marbles, and the irradiation would have changed five of them to red. So if you employed 2,000 people, eight hours a day, five days a week, and they were throwing marbles out the window at one per second each, then it would take 50 years to find the five red marbles. So I think it's fair to say this is a non-destructive way of examining these paintings. If that warehouse happened to be next to Central Park, Central Park would be covered with marbles knee deep. A trillion is a big number. In any event, this painting was also irradiated and it went by a schedule like this. So it was radiated for an hour and a half or so. And then we put a film on from five minutes to 10 minutes, then from 25 minutes to 35 minutes, then from four hours to four and three quarters, five, 24, one day, two days, four days, et cetera, trying to capture different half-lives, things that will decay at different time scales. And we put the gamma ray detector on to see which photons were coming off so we could identify the elements unambiguously. I'm going to focus on a couple of these. They did this to lots of different uh, pigments, but the dark umber here and dark ochre has manganese in it, and the bone black has phosphorus in it. So look at these paintings here, these, these uh, locations here. Here's the dress, it's, it's a, the um, umber, the cloak she has on, but she's got something light draped over her arm. And down here we have, shining through all the little angels here and the cherubs, we have the blue sky. Okay, so this is the black and white version of that same painting. And this is what the autoradiograph looks like after four to five hours. The cloak is made of umber, which has manganese, in particular, the common isotope of manganese, manganese 55, plus some iron oxide thrown in. Well, when you irradiate it with a neutron, you change this into manganese 56, and that is a two and a half hour half-life. So after a few hours, it's radiating like crazy because all the nuclei are falling apart, and it exposes the film as black, whereas that light thing draped over her arm doesn't show up because it's made of a different pigment with different elements in it. What goes on here is the manganese, manganese 20, 55 adds a neutron, becomes manganese 56. Manganese 56 is unstable. It zaps off an electron here and a 
zaps off a gamma ray here, the gamma ray is unambiguously one of these exact values in energy because that's what manganese does. And the thing turns into iron 56 because it's lost a negative charge here. This charge has to be number 26. If we go after two to four days, we see that that light thing over her arm was made of azurite because it's got copper 63, which we turn into copper 64, and it decays in a half a day or so. And down here, the ultramarine, it has sodium 24, which has a half-life of 15 hours. So after a couple days, it's still decaying and it's black. But the most fascinating thing about this is that if we look after 8 to 20 days, we see this, which doesn't look like anything here resembles anything about the painting until you flip it upside down and you see it's a self-portrait of Van Dyck. So when you go to the Museum of Modern, uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art and you look at this, this is what you see with your eyes. But if you could see what the atoms can see, you can see that he painted this painting over the top of a lovely self-portrait of himself. Okay, those are documents from which we have written records. Here are some drawings that we don't from the Chauvet cave in France. We date, date these by using carbon-14 dating because these beautiful drawings were done with charcoal. Charcoal, of course, is burnt wood. Burnt wood used to be alive. And as a consequence, its carbon-14 will decay away with time. And so we can take a tiny little scrape off one of these dark lines here, take it to the laboratory, put it in our mass spectrometer, and determine the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio that these were painted between 30,300 and 32,400 years ago. Well, the Europeans, of course, think they're this font of all culture. Uh, but maybe not so fast, because this painting of a nice wild boar up here and the, lots of hand stencils down here come from the Sulawesi cave in the Indonesian archipelago. Now, this is not made with charcoal. This is made with purely inorganic pigments, so there's no carbon-14 dating, so we can't do that. But what we can do is use speleothems. Maybe some of you have been in a cave where you see stalagmites and stalactites. This is mineral-rich water, mostly calcium carbonate-rich, that drips onto ca into caves. And in particular, it drips onto these paintings. So you see there's these little white splotches on top of the paintings. And if we could date those little white splotches, we know that the paintings must have been done before them. Well, it turns out that these mineral-rich waters readily incorporate uranium but exclude thorium. And uranium turns into thorium. So just like carbon turns into nitrogen, uranium turns into thorium. And as a consequence, we can use uranium thorium dating, dating and the uranium thorium dating says that these are 40,000 years old, 10,000 years older than the caves in France. Well, at least you think it's Homo sapiens that invented art, but if you believe this one, and it is controversial, <laughs> here's a hand stencil from a Neanderthal from more than 65,000 years before the present. Okay, let's shift gears here and talk about you are what you eat the history of human diet and agriculture, which we can also construct with isotopes. So you contain roughly 3,000 trillion trillion atoms. That is 100,000 times the number of stars in the universe. That's how small atoms are. And the top five are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and calcium. The next 10 are listed there. And those 15 make up 99.99% of all the atoms in you. But atoms are really tiny, so there's even plenty of those when we go down further. The important thing here is, though, that plants are what they eat, too, atom by atom. And in particular, as I said, plants suck carbon dioxide out of the air. And as they do so, they take some carbon-12, most of it's carbon-12, some carbon-13 dioxide, and some carbon-14 dioxide. It turns out that there are three separate photosynthetic pathways for different classes of plants as to how they use this carbon once they suck it out of the air. By far the oldest, it's been around for a couple billion years at least, is so-called C3 plants, which suck that carbon dioxide out of the air, use light to split off the oxygen, breathe that out, and make a chain of one, two, three carbon atoms in a row. All the trees, grasses, fruits, vegetables that grow in temperate climates use that process, as do phytoplankton in the ocean and lots of other plants on Earth as well. Much more recently in evolutionary terms, probably only a few tens of millions of years ago, a different process of photosynthesis developed which is basically the same process, except that the first step is one, two, three, four carbon atoms 
linked in a chain rather than just three. And importantly, maize, or what we call corn, sugarcane, sorghum, millet, salt marsh grasses, and other plants use the C4 process. There's a third process for cacti and things that live in deserts. We won't worry about that tonight. But the key point is that these two different processes, C3 and C4, treat the carbon isotopes differently. They still make the same carbon bonds. They still make the carbon bonds just like any atom would. But because the carbon dioxide has to be breathed in through these little things on the bottom of leaves called stomata, the water vapor and the O2 breathe out there, and these things open and close like little nostrils, the carbon dioxide doesn't always have an easy time getting in. And because the carbon-12 dioxide is lighter than the carbon-14 dioxide and the carbon-13 dioxide, those heavier molecules are moving more slowly. I've discovered this. I used to run marathons. Now I can't even run 10 blocks. I give a little, little extra mass there, and so, therefore, I move more slowly. The atoms that move more slowly get discriminated against. Now, the three-chain carbon C3 plants are in a big hurry. They just want to get this done. They just grab the three fastest ones, and they're all carbon-12s. So they discriminate against carbon-13 by about 2% compared to what comes in from the air. Whereas the C4 plants, well, they have to wait for four carbons to line up. And so they move a little slower. They're a little slower, and they can grab a carbon-13 occasionally. So they discriminate compared to the air by only about six-tenths of 1%. What we've discovered is this reflection of the plants that you eat shows up in your body because you are what you eat atom by atom, isotope by isotope. And as a consequence, for example, we've been able to show how corn, which was first domesticated 6,500 years ago in Oaxaca, south of the central highlands of Mexico, managed to get to New England before the Europeans showed up in New England in 1620, as it progressed across indigenous population to indigenous population, and they went from being hunter-gatherers to being agriculturalists and growing corn. So here we have a collection of bones over the last 6,000 years from Ohio. We date them using carbon-14 to carbon-12. That We understand how that works. We take the diet from carbon-13 to carbon-12, and we see it has zero, over on this right axis here, zero component from carbon-4 plants, because C4 plants don't exist in our temperate latitudes naturally. But as soon as this agriculture is introduced, around 900 AD, within a couple of centuries, we're up to 70% of the diet being maize. Now, it doesn't mean they ate 70% of the food they ate was maize, but of course the chickens ate the corn, and the deer ate the corn, and they ate the deer and the chickens, and the eggs came out of the chickens. And so the carbon isotope ratio was reflected throughout the whole food chain, and 70% of the diet comes from C4 plants. This has started very recently to be used for medical diagnostic reasons. Here's an example of nitrogen. So nitrogen comes in two varieties, nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14, both stable, so they don't do radioactive decay. And your body preferentially excretes nitrogen 14 because it's lighter and faster. And therefore your proteins and your molecules that make up your cells are preferentially higher in nitrogen 15. This is a graph where on the left, we see the percentage compared with air of nitrogen, 15 to 14. And on the right, we have body weight. And this is a woman who became pregnant at time equals zero here and had terrible case of morning sickness. She couldn't keep any food down. And so her weight plummeted by 10 pounds in her first trimester of pregnancy. And simultaneously, her nitrogen 15 excretion went up by this huge factor because when you can't digest externally imported food, you start digesting your own proteins, which are richer in nitrogen 15 compared to nitrogen 14, until she finally got over this in the second trimester and it started to gain weight nicely. Baby gained another 10 pounds here and the nitrogen 15 plunged back down again. Lots of possibilities for medical diagnostics here. And mammoths are what they eat. Here's a picture of a woolly mammoth. And we have this remarkable story from this mammoth that lived 17,100 years ago in Alaska. These tusks are over three meters long. And these people did a sampling of 240,000 measurements along the tusk, basically hour by hour over the lifetime of this mammoth. And they looked at three different ratios, or four different ratios really, strontium 87 to strontium 86, 
Those are two mineral ratios. Strontium is under calcium in the periodic table. And so it ends up in bones. Nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14, which I just discussed. Oxygen 18 to oxygen 16, which is a measure of temperature. And they did carbon as well. And this is what they found. They were able to track week by week the wanderings and lifestyle of this mammoth from 17,100 years ago. We see the mammoth stayed with its matrilineal herd for the first 15 years, exactly as elephants do today. And then it wandered away. It started doing annual visits, changing the, changing the uh, locations it grazed in the winter versus the summer. And then in the end, it ended up dying because here you see the nitrogen 15 goes off the top. It's ran out of food and started digesting its own protein. It died of starvation. And with this, because strontium-87 to strontium-86 varies so rapidly geologically from place to place, they've managed to map out the life of this mammoth who started out here in the Yukon Delta, wandered around here with his mother for a long time, then got a little, little frisky and went off by himself, ended up north of the Brooks Range and died right where the white little mammoth is there. And the black squiggly line you see here is where the mammoth was week by week. It's the mammoth's diary written in its tusks through the isotopes of strontium, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. And it's not just people and animals and plants that are what we feed it. The atmosphere is what we feed it too. Again, isotope by isotope. So here, for example, is the carbon-13 in the air going back to 1350. They might say, well, I can go back to 1350. They didn't know atoms existed in 1350, let alone could they measure the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. But we have trees that are that old. We have coral reefs that are that old. We have deep-sea sediments that go back much farther than that. And if you go in a tree and you count the rings, you know exactly to the year, because there's one ring per year, you go exactly back to 1350, you can sample the wood from 1350, it will have the isotope ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 that was in the atmosphere when that ring was laid down in the tree 800 years ago. So you see, it's very flat for a long time until 1800. Well, what happened in 1800? The Industrial Revolution. And you see the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio starts to plummet, and it goes down faster and faster until we get past 1950, and then it's going almost straight down, and today it's about to fall off the bottom of the graph. So what is going on? Well, for carbon-14, it's even more dramatic. Carbon-14, yeah, it'll decay with time over 5,700 years, but here we have a decade, and it's changed by 3% in a decade, going steadily downhill. What's happening? Well, as you probably have heard, people argue, I will argue, that we're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, or something is adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. You'll hear some climate denialists say, oh, it's volcanoes. Volcanoes put a lot of, a lot of carbon dioxide. It's true. Volcanoes do put out carbon dioxide. And in fact, it's carbon dioxide with a very high C13 to C12 ratio. This carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean, and some of it evaporates and some of it goes back, just like shake your bottle of Coke, you know, the CO2 comes out. And that's more or less a wash, depending on the isotope, doesn't matter. And plants, as we've already seen, discriminate against carbon-13, so they have a low carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio. What about carbon-14? Well, carbon-14 is produced by cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere from old supernovae we passed by. But in fact, we doubled the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere between 1952 and 1963 when we were blowing up nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. So that has a high carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio. Plants also have a have a low carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio, but when the plants die and rot, they release the carbon back into the atmosphere. So over years, it's sort of a wash. But plants that were alive 300 million years ago, like coal, oil, and natural gas, have a zero carbon-14 content because it's 5,000 years, half of it's decayed, now 10,000 years, three quarters of it's decayed, and in 300 million years, 100.0% of it has decayed. So there's no carbon-14. So here's the situation. We've got an atmosphere that's mostly carbon-12, that's the green dots, a couple of carbon-13s, that's the white dots. And very rarely, I didn't bother to put a trillion dots on here because it would take a long time, but I'm representing the carbon-14, rare carbon-14 by a red dot. And we're gonna add 
some gas to this atmosphere. So if we add it from volcanoes, we'll add a little bit of carbon-14, but lots of carbon-13 compared to carbon-12, and the carbon-13 to 12 ratio will rise, whereas I just showed you the graph that it's falling precipitously. So this is opposite of the observed trend. If we use modern plants as the source, well, there's less carbon-13 and less carbon-14, but the carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio falls. Carbon-14 to carbon-12 stays small, but it doesn't plummet at 10%, 3% every 10 years. So that's not the observed carbon-14 trend. If we add it from ancient plants, that is fossil fuels, then we're adding zero carbon-14, a little bit of carbon-13, and lots of carbon-12. The carbon-13 to carbon-12 ratio falls, carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio falls exactly as occurred. And we can do this exactly as is observed, rather. And we can do this uh, quantitatively and measure the effect. So it is a fact, I would assume, assert, that the Earth's atmosphere CO2 content is increasing at 0.7% per year, and nearly all of it, something over 80%, is a consequence of burning these ancient fossil fuels with no carbon-14. And the result of that, of course, is that the temperature this past year in 2023, the global temperature was 1.43 degrees centigrade, or almost 3 degrees Fahrenheit, above average, which is perilously close to the 1.5 degrees that the negotiators in Paris told us eight years ago, uh, we were going to need to avoid. But we only have about 140 years of instrumental records. And if we want to build a model that you can believe in to extrapolate forward in time as carbon dioxide increases and what the temperature will do, we need a much longer record. And that longer record comes from the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. The ice in Greenland and Antarctica is two to three miles thick. You can drill out cores that look like this and you measure the ice going backwards in time. The isotopes give you the temperature, the isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen. The air bubbles give little samples of the atmosphere at that time. So it's just as though you had a chemist 147,300 years ago who sealed off a little ampule for you and said, oh, this is what the atmosphere was like in that year. Here's an example from 1.8 kilometers deep in Greenland. You still see the annual layers here of snow and then freezing to ice and snow and freezing to ice, snow and freezing to ice. And you see all these tiny little bubbles, just like the bubbles in your ice cubes in your freezer. They trap a sample of the air from that time. And this is what it looks like if you just look back 10,000 years. Nitrous oxides, flat, until the Industrial Revolution goes up 26%. Methane, pretty flat, the last 10,000 years, till the Industrial Revolution goes up 330%. And CO2, same thing, goes up 52%. But if we go back much longer, here's a graph for 450,000 years into the past. Now, this is the most important graph in this whole presentation, so I'm going to take a minute to do this. This axis in red is CO2, 180 parts per million to 280 parts per million. And that's what the red line is here. And the red line clearly wiggles around, falls down to a minimum of 180 parts per million, and then quickly jumps back up again to 280 parts per million, then slowly falls, and then jumps back up, and slowly falls, and then jumps back up in a regular repeating pattern of about 100,000 years. The other axis on the right-hand side is the temperature, and now it's measured in something like a range of 16 degrees centigrade or 30 degrees Fahrenheit which is a huge change in temperature. And that's represented by the blue line. And you see how beautifully it follows the red line. It falls in the same way and jumps up quickly in the same way. It falls in the same way and jumps up quickly in the same way. There's a tight correlation between the CO2 and the climate. And that's where we are today, completely off the scale with CO2, not yet quite off the scale with temperature, but the CO2 today is higher than it's been at any time in at least the last 15 million years. So if people tell you we're not doing a major geochemical experiment on the atmosphere, you should not believe them. What about going further back in time for the death of the dinosaurs? Well, many outcroppings on Earth look like this around the time the dinosaurs disappeared. Below this black silty layer here, there's lots of dinosaur bones of all kinds. And above, there are zero dinosaur bones except birds. What a young geologist named Walter Alvarez discovered in 1980 was that iridium-193, an element which is very rare on the surface of the Earth, 
and accumulates very slowly in layers of rock like this, went from 0.3 parts per billion to nine parts per billion, a 3,000% increase right at this boundary, which is called the cretaceous Paleogene boundary. And from that concluded, since the only source of Iridium-193 we know of is meteorites, that it had to become from an extraterrestrial origin. You find in that same layer, diamonds, glasses, fused quartz, and zircons. And zircons are incredibly useful, that's zirconium, silicon, and four oxygens, because it incorporates uranium and excludes lead. And again, the nice thing is uranium decays to lead. So it provides what we call an accumulation clock, where here we have this diagram of things falling exponentially, factor of two every half-life. And you see, as the parent decays away, as the uranium decays away, the daughter nucleus, the lead ultimately, goes up. So after one half-life, there's 50% of each. After two half-lives, there's 75% of one and 25% of the other. If you're at a ratio of 80 to 20, then it's 2.3 half-lives, you have the date. So it's a little more complicated than this in practice, but in principle, we can use that and potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, and we get an age for this event of 66.043 plus or minus 0.04 million years ago. This is the most accurate date known in geological history. We know this to four decimal places. The aftermath of the giant asteroid that hit Yucatan in Mexico and produced this iridium layer was quite dramatic. Worldwide forest fires, because there's ash in this layer that represents about 50% of the plant matter on the entire planet burned almost instantaneously. There were giant tsunamis, especially around the Caribbean. When we're talking tsunamis, a kilometer tall, not just 50 meters tall or something like that. The dinosaurs were really unlucky because this region is rich in, rich in anhydrite, which is gypsum, which has sulfur in it. And when you throw sulfur into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, you get sulfuric acid. And sulfuric acid condenses into little drops, which are incredibly shiny. We see this when volcanoes do this today, and they reflect sunlight back. The temperature went from 20 degrees centigrade to minus 5 degrees centigrade in a matter of weeks. Roughly 100 trillion tons of dust and ash rained out of the air. The huge amount of water vapor evaporated in the Caribbean and the CO2 from all the forest fires raised the temperature after it got warm again for 10,000 years. And remarkably, when this sulfuric acid rained out of the atmosphere, it was about three gallons per square meter of pure acid. This is serious acid rain. And we know this because the strontium-87 to strontium-86 ratio in seawater is different than the strontium-87 to strontium-86 ratio in rocks on land. And yet at the 66 million year point, we see this sudden jump in the strontium-87 to strontium-86 ratio, suggesting huge amounts of rock were melted and washed into the ocean and change the entire ocean's strontium ratio for something like a million years. This event eliminated something like 57% of all plant species and greater than 80% of all marine organisms, and of course, all the dinosaurs. But the little furry things that were around at the time, the first mammals, did very well because they stored up nuts for the winter, and that's what turned into us today. So we have the meteor to thank for that. What about the solar system itself? There's a very clever way, and if someone wants to see all the equations, I can supply them, so send me an email, that we can use rubidium and strontium to date the age of the solar system, by which I really mean date the age of the oldest meteors, because that's the oldest things we know of in the solar system. Rubidium-87 decays very slowly to strontium-87 by emitting an electron and an antineutrino. And if we take the ratio of strontium-87 to the stable isotope strontium-86 compared to the ratio of rubidium-87 to the stable ratio of strontium-86. We can plot a line, and the slope of this line tells us directly the age, and the age of the solar system, in case anybody asks you, is 4.568 plus or minus 0.01 billion years. Again, a stunningly accurate date for our history. And why not stop there? Why go to the history of the universe itself? So we can look at the distant galaxies, now with JWST, even more distant galaxies. And we find in the oldest stars and in the most distant galaxies, the helium to hydrogen ratio is about 25%. Ever since the Big Bang, of course, stars have been making hydrogen into helium. They've changed it by about a percent or so. But the earliest ones is 25%. And likewise, the ratio of heavy hydrogen, deuterium, to normal hydrogen 
is about 3.5 times 10 to the minus 5. Now, those two numbers tell us that the helium to hydrogen ratio at 300 seconds, when the universe was 300 seconds old, five minutes old, was about two neutrons for every 14 protons, whereas the deuterium to hydrogen ratio tells you when the universe was one second old, there were two neutrons for every 10 protons. And combining these things can give us the temperature, the composition, and the density of the universe, which allows us to extrapolate back to the first millionth of a second of the Big Bang using our atomic historians. So Big Bang nucleosynthesis at three minutes, temperature of the universe is a billion degrees, density of the universe is about 10 times that of the air, and that's the end of the synthesis of helium. It's all over by then. Subsequently, helium can be made in stars, but as I say, it only adds 1% over 13 billion years. Go back to the first second. Temperature is now 10 billion degrees. Density is about a tenth the density of water in matter, but there's a huge amount of radiation because the electrons and the positrons have all annihilated each other and produced photons. For reasons we do not understand, there was a slight asymmetry in the number of particles and antiparticles by about one part in a billion, which gives us a billion photons for every proton, neutron, or electron in the universe. But we can go back before that to the lepton error, <clears throat> 10 to the minus four seconds. Temperature is now up to a trillion degrees. The density is now the density of the nucleus of an atom, but it's a nucleus of the atom the size of the solar system. The entire universe fits in the solar system. And we have protons, neutrons, electrons, and positrons around. And we can go back to the Hadron era, 10 to the minus 6 seconds. The universe is 10 trillion degrees. The density is 10 times the density of the nucleus of the atom. And that's when the quarks, which we don't see anymore in the universe alone, that's when the quarks bind together in to make protons, which eventually make hydrogen atoms, which eventually cooked up in stars make the other atoms of the periodic table, which eventually make planets and Earths and humans. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think everyone's muted. <laughs> I just switched. I just switched the more to allow them to unmute themselves. Hopefully okay. that'll work. All right. So let's uh, take uh, a few minutes if to uh, entertain some questions, please. And if you can't, you can't unmute yourself, put your questions into the chat, please. Oh, let me get to the chat then. Mm -hmm. I'll stop sharing. So I can get to the chat. Uh, I have a quick question. Could you go over once again, uh, calculating the age of the universe? Uh, I I didn't see, did you come up with a number? What was the number? I mean, does it agree with whatever 13.8 billion years? 13.8 billion years, 13.81 to be precise. Okay. No, I did not calculate the age of the universe using these isotopes because that's not a good way to do it because they're not, none of them are radioactive. Okay. I mean, tritium is radioactive, but it decays in 12 years. So there's none of that left over from the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. um, so we made, measured the age of the universe in a couple other ways, most importantly with the microwave background radiation. And that's where the 13.81 plus or minus 0.01 billion years comes from. But we use that to impose on the model that allows me to extrapolate back to a millionth of a second. Okay. There do not seem to be any chat questions at the moment. You know, let me ask you this quick. This is a little bit off the wall question, but I, in your earlier book, you talk about um, using the right number of significant figures, and you've been quoting the numbers tonight to you know four decimal places. Um, how do you keep track of of your significant figures, and are you overdoing the level of accuracy you can? obtain well so so this is one of my favorite topics <laughs> but i'll try not to go on too long so significant figures convey information they convey how accurate your number is in the cases of the numbers i quoted tonight sometimes it was just two one or two significant figures 
Sometimes it was to four or five significant figures, but I put the error bars, plus or minus something, plus or minus 0.04, plus or minus 0.26 or whatever. And that represents the uncertainty. What, that, what those plus or minus numbers represent is that there is a 67% chance that it's within plus or minus one of those error bars, and it's a 95% chance it's in plus or minus two of those error bars. So when I measured the age of the Shroud of Turin to plus or minus 60 years, that means it's within plus or minus the number of plus or minus 60 years, plus or minus 120 years would be 95% accurate. But the things like the age of the solar system and <clears throat> and the age of the dead death of the dinosaurs, those the numbers were very small. And I quoted the right number of significant figures, which is supposed to be the number that you have plus one, the number of the accuracy you have plus one. Because if you want to round up, you need to know what that last one was. Okay, we do have a question. Can you put the diagram back up with the spike light in CO2 and temperature? And how long do we have until the temperature spikes out of control? Is is 2C even possible in light of the spike in the CO2 and how temps follows? Right, that's, this is an important point that I didn't make explicitly. <clears throat> you see this now? Not at the moment. Really? Really. There you go. Yeah, it's coming up now. Okay. So the thing, the important point about that is that this axis here is 450,000 years. That means the width of this line, the width of either line, the red line or the blue line, is about 1,000 years. So when I say these go up and down together, like here the red line and the blue line are right on top of each other, that's plus or minus a thousand years they're going up together. Okay. The point is the ocean provides a huge buffer to the increase in temperature that CO2 is producing. The ocean is warming quite rapidly, but water, water has many, many times the heat capacity of air. So most of the extra energy that's being trapped by the carbon dioxide we're putting in the earth today, which is this huge number here, is being absorbed by the ocean. How long that lasts is a critical question. And it's a very tricky question to answer because there are all kinds of feedback loops in the system. So for example, the ocean gets a little warmer, so that means more ice in the Arctic melts. And that exposes more ocean. Instead of light reflecting back into space off the ice, it now gets absorbed by the warm ocean. And so that is the feedback that's running away and making the ice melt faster. However, as the ocean gets warmer, it evaporates more readily. And as it evaporates more readily and rises up in the atmosphere, it makes clouds. And clouds are great at reflecting sunlight back into space. So that effect actually cancels out the other effect. But it doesn't cancel it out perfectly. And the question is, which one wins? These are called feedback loops. And the recent study showed 47 feedback loops in the climate system, 42 of which are positive, five of which are negative. And we don't understand most of them. I mean, we understand that they exist. We understand them qualitatively, but we don't understand them quantitatively. And so it's very hard to answer the second part of that question. How long is it going to take for the temperature to catch up? You will see. Whoops. Here's my temperature plot. There we go. You will see that this has been rising steadily since the 1960s, 1970s or so. And it was rising steadily until the last few years in which all of them were above the extrapolation, and last year was way above the extrapolation. So far, since last June, every month, eight months in a row, June, July, August, September, October, November, January, February, are all the hottest of those months in the last 140 years. So I, will, I don't, don't want to say that we're beginning to see these diagrams catch up, that the blue line is going to catch up to this. I hope, certainly hope not because that would be 10 degrees centigrade rise, which would be fatal. Um, it's going to take a while. But if we don't curb this increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this temperature is inevitably going to start to rise. And it's not going to rise just by one degree. Here's two degrees. Here's three degrees. Here's four degrees, which is the estimate by the end of this century, another 75 years. But the real reason to answer your question is the thickness of this line is a thousand years. And these 
beautiful correlations here are on a thousand year time scale, not on a decade time scale. And we've done this in a matter of a few decades. Since we're on since we're on this, sorry, since we're on this topic and you've given a great deal of thought to this, would be interested in your opinions about the not so much the feasibility, but do you think we will get to the point where the so-called geoengineering approaches, whether it's sulfur dioxide droplets in the upper atmosphere, or even more an astronomical theme, mirrors reflecting sunlight, maybe out at Lagrange point. Some of these ideas that are out there, even the National Academy of Sciences has produced a white paper on this. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, what do you think about those approaches as a way out of this dilemma? I think there, it's possible that we will be driven to those approaches. I think there are many manifest problems with those approaches. The mirrors idea is sort of nuts. I mean, it takes trillions of dollars to do it with the mirrors. Sulfur dioxide is, is doable. The sulfur, you can do it with mo relatively modest, well, billions of dollars, but not trillions of dollars. I mean, a tiny fraction of GDP needs to be expended on it. The question is, which countries are you going to put all this reflective stuff over? Which, which agriculture are you going to destroy in the process? And of course, the other thing is the disadvantage, the, the problems of CO2 being added to the atmosphere are not strictly restricted to temperature. The ocean acidification, the ocean is acidifying rapidly. And reflecting sunlight from Earth does nothing for them if you keep pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We have enough fossil fuels to last for hundreds of years. You know, 50 years ago, people said, oh, peak oil, oil, we're going to run out of oil. We're not going to run out of oil. We're not going to run out of gas. And we're certainly not going to run out of coal. There's hundreds of years worth. And if we keep burning it, the ocean will become a completely transformed place because the acidity already has been a 25% increase in acidity in just the last 50 years or so. And it's starting to affect the plankton at the foot of the food chain um, and have very serious consequences. So there are other reason that you don't want to add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than just the temperature. And I think the geoengineering ideas, I do think they should be studied because I think they, the, I, I don't think the mirrors idea is, I think that's crazy, but the, the, the flying planes in the stratosphere idea is probably not crazy. The, the political opposition to it is that, oh, if you, if you let people know there's a way out, then we'll just keep burning coal. And, and that as I say, has other negative consequences. I, and I think that the geopolitical consequences of who, whose airplanes spray whose atmosphere with sulfur to reflect all the sunlight away is going to be a real problem in a multipolar world. Professor, we have another up. chat question. Yeah, uh, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi, this is Shok. Uh, great talk, Professor. I'm just curious uh, when you went through the various contributing factors that are uh, causing a lot of these temperature changes, et cetera. Uh, the impact of large forest fires that we've been experiencing up here in North America and maybe other places in the world that seem to last for weeks together and so on, what's the cumulative effect of that on, on all of these uh, projections? It's significant, especially this past year in Canada where it went from a few million hectares to 40 million hectares. That's a big difference. I said it's 80 to 85% comes from burning fossil fuels. The other 15% comes from land use changes, which forest fires are the dominant source. So whether you're burning tropical rainforests or Siberian tundra forests or Canadian uh, forests, that adds carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it adds carbon dioxide that's low in carbon 13 and low in carbon 14, just like the data suggests because trees discriminate against carbon-13 and carbon-14. So it's consistent uh, with, the, with the data to say that something between 15 and 20% of the carbon dioxide is coming from these fires, and accelerations like we saw in Canada this past year are, are pretty frightening. Okay, thank you. All right, well, it's getting pretty late. I'm thinking we should close out the questions and thank our guest speaker for being flexible enough to Zoom with us tonight. Yes, well, I would have preferred to meet you all in person, but I appreciate your attendance and thank you for the opportunity.
And just to give a shout out about the book, I understand that's readily available on Amazon or at uh, Labyrinth Books in Princeton and elsewhere uh, from your favorite publishers. So we should keep that in mind as well, even there if you can't there's, get there's it. There's a QR code. And if you if you read this slide, if you can read this slide, let's see, can we expand this here? You can get 20% off if you want to buy the book at Columbia University Press, which published it. Oh, cool. You just have to go to the Columbia, Columbia cup.columbia.edu and enter the code when you're checking out CUP20 and you get a 20% discount. I must say they're a lot slower than Amazon. So if you're <laughs> really burning to buy the book, then you should go to Amazon or your Labyrinth bookstore. Um, but otherwise you can get it here. And I hope you enjoy it. And if you ever encounter you in any other circumstance, I'd be more than happy to sign it. <laughs> yeah, I have the book and it's wonderful. I've started reading it. Oh, well, thank it's you. It's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell Amazon that so some other people know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, and as long as we're uh, uh, plugging, I'd like to uh, to recommend uh, your earlier book, A Survival Guide to the Misinformation Age, where you talk about scientific habits of mind. It's a great, it's a great book. Oh, uh, I have a, well, I should do this some other time, but uh, you you have like thought problems, which you have, people work through at the at the uh, at the end i still haven't figured out how would you decide how many fax machines there are in manhattan <laughs> well these days that would be harder but I, I still have a fax machine and i live in manhattan so i don't use the fax machine but i have one yeah my favorite review here is by paul offit who's the guy you hear on the radio all on tv all the time about vaccines from philadelphia he said <laughs> He channels Steven Pinker's ability to dissect language with Richard Dawkins' ability to explain our existence with George Carlin's ability to make us laugh. If there are two people I would more want to be, D Richard Dawkins and George Carlin are it. So I thought that was the best review ever. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, a good eclipse, and good observing. Thank you.